evening. I'm Alex Halliday. Welcome to the Columbia Climate School Earth series. Tonight, we examine the impacts of climate change on the global food supply. Rising temperatures and changing rainfall patterns are increasingly putting food and nutritional security at risk across the entire world. From the United States Corn Belt, where climate change and wind patterns are impacting growing seasons, to climate-related disasters, which make it harder to grow food, a fact contributing to an increase in hunger all around the world. At the same time, the industrial food system is contributing as much as 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. This is a many-faceted dilemma with very high stakes. Tonight, I'm joined by two of the Climate School's leading experts who specialize in understanding, predicting, and dealing with the risks of food security. Ruth de Vries is co-founding Dean of the Columbia Climate School and the Denning Family Professor of Sustainable Development in the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Biology. Ruth uses images from satellites and field surveys to examine how the world's demands for food and other resources are changing land use throughout the tropics. Her research quantifies how these land use changes affect climate, biodiversity, and other ecosystem services, as well as human development. I should also say that Ruth is what we call a university professor, which is a very distinguished honor at Columbia University. It doesn't sound as grand as it really is. There are very few of them at Columbia, and she is one of the well, very special um, highly achieved, uh, highly uh, accomplished academics that we have. So it's fabulous to have her involved uh, in the climate school, but also what we're doing in terms of talking about food security. John Furlow directs Columbia University's International Research Institute for Climate and Society. IRI, as it is called, is a global leader in the creation and provision of climate services and leads the Columbia World Project uh, that we have several Columbia World projects, but this was the first ever that uh, Columbia launched, dedicated to integrating climate services into six national approaches for achieving the sustainable food security, uh, sustainable food security and nutrition. John's work in climate change adaptation has spanned the entire globe. Uh, his work is amazing, and the IRI's work is amazing. You'll be hearing more about that today. And I have to say, out of personal note that one of the most exciting uh, things I talk about, I used to talk about when I said I was moving to New York to lead the Earth Institute, was the fact that IRI took this amazing research that had been done and turned it into action on the ground to improve livelihoods uh, in communities and countries that were facing uh, ravages of the ravages of, of climate variability associated with El Nino. So this is a hugely important part of what we deliver. And John, it's fantastic to have you uh, with us today. Um, so Ruth, tell us a bit more about the way this, you know, food production actually relates to climate change. Uh, around the world, we can see some very close interdependency of food production on weather and global climate, but there's more to that. How does, how does food production actually drive climate change? Well, it, it, this topic is very, uh, has so many different aspects to it. One is that, uh, that food production is severely affected by climate change. And the other is that food production affects climate change. So as John said, uh, producing food is a highly climate sensitive endeavor in the farming, the storage, the transport, and, uh, and the increasing variability in climate is one, one reason why we see farmers around the world who are uh, looking for alternatives because it is such a precarious way to uh, make a living in a, in a very increasingly variable world. I see that I work a lot in India and we see that the, uh, the monsoons are becoming more variable and are predicted to become more variable with, with uh, climate change in the future. And that is, creates a highly, highly uncertain condition for, uh, for farmers whose livelihoods are just completely dependent 
on on the crop and we see we see farmers who are looking for alternatives and and uh, you know not and wanting their children to go into a, a different occupation because it's so precarious. And it you know it's also surprising that uh, in the U.S. in our country, uh, food production is very climate and weather dependent. Uh, Fifty percent of the cropland in the U.S. is rain fed. That's a surprising statistic, uh, meaning there, it's not irrigated, uh, depends on the rain. And if it doesn't rain, there isn't water for the crops. And we're seeing the effects of, of drought, uh, particularly in the West. So that's 40%, 50% of the land cropland area in the US and 40% of the production. So that's uh, highly dependent uh, even in the industrialized intensive agriculture in the, uh, in the US, uh, not to mention the sensitivity to increasing temperature. So that's the, the impact of climate change on food production is large, but also uh, food production has a large impact on climate change. As you mentioned, Alex, about a quarter, 20 or a quarter of the um, of uh, greenhouse gases come from food production, whether it's carbon dioxide from deforestation, clearing forests to grow food, whether it's methane for uh, from livestock and rice paddies or nitrous oxide from uh, fertilizer. All of these together contribute a large proportion of, of, of greenhouse gases. And there is, um, I think, a, a large scope to reduce these emissions. And a lot of people are talking about this as part of nature-based solutions, one of the important areas for our research in the, in the climate school. So, uh, so there's just so many ways that food production intersects with, uh, with climate. So can I just follow on just a little bit from that? So the, the other thing, of course, that's changing is the human population, which is like people are living longer, they're enjoying better lifestyles, they want more food, they want, they want beef, whatever, rather than rice. So, you know, there's a certain sense that there's a, 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 there's a sort of, you know, we're shooting ourselves in the foot by being so, by improving our standard of living. At the same time, actually, of course, everybody wants to improve standard of living. How how does the how does how does this work from the point of view of the population growing and the ecosystem changing at the same time? And is there a sort of um, are people waking up to the problem we're facing with this? Um, well, it that it brings up a lot of um, complications because in some parts of the world, like in the industrialized world. Uh, people eat way more animal source foods, way more protein than they actually need. Yeah. In some parts of the world, people don't get enough and increased animal source foods would be a benefit for their diet. So it's a very, um, you know, very, in, there's so much imbalance, some having too much and some not having enough. But we do see, as you say, that it's just nearly universal that when incomes increase and standards of living increase, the consumption demand for animal source food uh, increases. And we know that animal source foods has a, has a large uh, footprint on, yeah. uh, on greenhouse gases. So I, wouldn't, I would not want to say that, uh, that people who do not get enough animal source food should not increase their consumption. We'd say that there's plenty of scope for, uh, for those of us and the parts of the world where we consume more than we need to uh, to reduce consumption. Right. So, John, um, the IRI. I mean, typically you're focused on uh, short-term concerns, whereas whereas climate change, we're typically thinking about you know what's going to happen over the next 10, 20 years. Oh my gosh, the end of the century. What will life be like? And um, whereas you're, you've mainly been built around short-term climate variability things. Could you fill us in on the workings of this dynamic, how it, how it actually plays out in terms of your center in particular? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, so most people, when they think about, when they hear about climate change and the models that you think about, you're thinking about the, the big global circulation models that are used um, mm. by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that you hear about the reports that come out of there and in the run-up to the UN negotiations, the COPs and so forth. And those, <clears throat> excuse me, those models, as you said, they, they produce outputs mostly for the end of the century or the middle of the century. And those models were created originally 
to answer a few fairly simple questions. You know, what happens to the climate if you put a whole lot more CO2 into the atmosphere? And is what happens bad enough to make changes? And is it really bad enough to try to restructure the energy and transportation systems of the world and maybe the food system of the world? Those are not, those data uh, are not useful for everyday decision-making. And so when you're working, again, when you're working in developing countries and you try to talk to a farmer about how he or she is going to adapt to increasing variability and you sit down and you try to say, well, in 80 years, these models say that it could be two or three degrees warmer on average. They kind of think, well, my God, this guy is telling me that my great grandchildren are still gonna be farmers in 80 years. And two degrees, that's, that doesn't matter. It's two degrees warmer at noon than it was in the morning. So it's just not the right kind of information for the decisions that people are making. And, but when you think about farming, which dominates the economies of a lot of developing countries, if you can tell them what's gonna happen across the next three months, then they could start thinking, do I need to, if it's gonna be dry, can I get my hands on a drought tolerant seed or a rapidly maturing seed so that I can get the yields that I need in the conditions that I think I'm going to face? Uh, and the same, you know, we also have tools that work with malaria forecasting. If it's gonna be dry, you're gonna have fewer mosquitoes. Um, and so this, we find that this time scale of information of a few months into the future is really helpful for, for supporting the decisions that are most common and most important for everyday lives in the developing world. Okay, so tell me a bit more. So um, how does this actually work in terms of getting forecasts to people? How do you make that actually happen, John? Um, so I'll admit I am not a forecaster, um, but I work with them. And so I'll do my best to try to explain. Yeah. Um, we like to work through a model where we train the weather agencies or the meteorological, the med agencies in developing countries to use the data that they have locally and kind of merge it with uh, the big global circulation models that produce seasonal forecasts. There's so they have, the, they have their own data, is that what you're saying? And you, you, yes, you um, most countries, uh, there's a lot of data disparities. Um, poorer countries tend to have, you know, you get data from a weather station. The US is very thoroughly covered. Um, in the tropics where most developing countries lie, there are far fewer weather stations, so there's less data being generated. Um, but the more data you have from local sources, the better you can sort of tweak the, the models and get a, a richer local forecast. And so we can take global seasonal forecast models and work with developing country, well, any country, it doesn't matter whether they're poor or rich, work with the, the weather department there to create uh, their own seasonal forecasts that are enriched by their local data. And with this, uh, they get a better outlook for what's going to be happening within their boundaries and within their region than if they simply downloaded data from a satellite. Um, and the nice thing about the way that we work is that it's this capacity building model. And so uh, if whatever project brings us into a place ends, if we've built their capacity to do this on their own and given them access to their own data and to the global data, they can keep doing this on their own. Right, got it. So is there, a, can you give me an example? Uh, can you tell us about a, a, a way, an illustration of how these seasonal forecasts actually make a difference? Sure. Um, I had a project when I was still with USAID, I was working in Jamaica. And we started working with uh, the weather agency, which was very small and under-resourced and very unpopular with some of the the, the water authority, the agriculture ministry, they didn't really know them very well. They felt like they weren't very helpful, um, but they had this vital information. Um, and so we worked with them to identify and with the agriculture ministry and identified that the biggest threat facing a lot of farmers in Jamaica was an unexpected drought. Um, I expected them to just talk about hurricanes, but they said, no, drought is really problematic for us. So we then, trained the Met Department um, to produce a drought forecast. And we worked with the agriculture ministry to communicate that information out to farmers. 
And the, the tool went online in, I think in January of 2014, right at the beginning of a really, really bad two year drought. Um, across the whole country, agricultural production went down by about 50% from 2013 to 2014. Um, among farmers who did not have irrigation, the drop was closer to 70%. But we went back and surveyed farmers who did have access to the tools that we developed and that we're working with the Ag Extension Service and the Met Department and getting text messages and, and other information about what was happening as the forecast, as the, the drought evolved. And their losses were more in the 30 to 40% range. So they cut their losses in half. And what we learned that they did was some of them uh, saw several months in advance that this drought was coming. Yeah. So they stored water. They went and filled barrels from small ponds and, and streams. Others changed the varieties that they planted or they switched from uh, low value staple crops to higher value uh, cash crops where when they put paid to put water on it, they would be able to sell the crops for more. Um, they, they did other on-farm practices and then a, a not small number simply took a year off and said, I'm not going to invest in my farm. And they went to Kingston or Montego Bay and worked in tourism or something else and uh, maintain their incomes that way. Okay, so I mean, we should talk about Africa because Africa clearly is a massive uh, area of concern with climate change. And can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing there and like in Senegal and places like that and, and how much success you've had there? Sure, we've worked in Africa, all over Africa for a very long time. Um, one of our great colleagues came from the Ethiopian Meteorological Agency and he now works with us. Um, I'll, the most recent, what I thought was a really cool success was um, the president of Senegal gave a speech at the end of 2020. So his new year's, you know, end of year, beginning of the new year speech. And he said something like, uh, my weather agency gave me a forecast that said that the rainy season would be good this year. And so I increased government purchase of, of inputs for farmers significantly. So he bought, you know, more seeds, more fertilizer, et cetera. And in the end, uh, Senegal had a record year for crop for food production. Um, farmer incomes were higher than they've ever been. And they didn't have to import any food. And in many years, Senegal imports up to half of its food. So this is a positive example of some, a, a, a person in a position to make very important decisions, taking the information, using it to, to support the sector, and then the beneficiaries of those decisions being able to turn that into better livelihoods, not just for themselves, but mm -hmm. for the whole country. That's great. Fantastic. Um, so uh, it would be great to see talk more about how you scale this up to, you know, to many other areas as well. Let's get to um, what you see as the, uh, you know, the major, most pressing issues for you to consider here and now. Ruth, what do you think are in the, the in terms of the global food supply, the food resources? What do you think are the the biggest issues that need to be thought through and and um, researched and figured out? Oh. There are just so many, so many. That's a very hard question. Um, I think I'll just uh, highlight two. One is uh, a question that is with us in the here and now is getting more equity in access to healthy mm -hmm. foods. We see you know, unhealthy diets permeating into the developing world. We have on this planet more than enough food for everyone, more than enough. And there has been an incredible increase we'll, in production. With population growth, is that going to stay? Yes. Same? Over the last 50, 60 years, uh, food production has increased even faster than population. Okay. So per person, there is more than enough food on this produced. Uh, but we have nearly a million people who do not have enough food, undernourished people, and nearly 2 billion who are overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of people yeah. with micronutrient deficiencies. So we have this amazing technologies to increase production. Uh, they create a large environmental footprint, and they're not delivering the healthy food that that people need. So 
I would say the pressing issue is, is about equity in access to healthy, healthy food. That's one. Can I do another one? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, another, what I think is a very underappreciated um, pressing need is to preserve the diversity of types of crops and varieties of animals that we rely on for food um, mm. over the last, you know, with this, with this incredible increase in production over the last 50, 60 years, we've lost a lot of the diversity in our food supply. So about three quarters of the world's calories that people eat come from a dozen plant species and five animal species. That's a very homogeneous um, Gosh, yeah. uh, reliance on, on uh, not diversity. And we know that we need diversity of different types of crops, different varieties within crops uh, for climate resilience to be able to breed the drought resistant crops that John mentioned um, and, uh, and the seed banks like the seed bank in uh, Svalbard, what's known as the doomsday vault and seed banks around the world are so critical, chronically underfunded to maintain that uh, diversity of the, of the plants that we, uh, that we rely on. I can't think of anything more important. Right, right. That's a really good point. Um, John, what do you think in terms of what do you think are the most pressing issues to consider here and now? Well, I certainly agree with both of Ruth's points. I'll kind of riff on her first one on equity and, and widespread access to nutritious food and say that behind the, the massive growth in food production in parts of the world has been te the technology that that Ruth mentioned, part of that technology is uh, is the climate information. And that is, it's very hard to reach people in some parts of the world with complicated information. They're not online. Um, and so I just as, you know, as Ruth said, the, the there's not equal access to food. Um, there's not equal access to information. A lot of the undernourished people that she mentions are smallholder or subsistence farmers. And so one way to improve the food security of all the people that Ruth mentioned about mentioned is to ensure that the poorest and the most vulnerable farmers who mostly just produce hopefully enough, often not enough food for their themselves and their families have the tools they need to, to change with the times, to keep up with the, the variability that we're seeing increasingly. And so that means making a more concerted effort on linking the best science that comes out in these forecasts that we're talking about with uh, the development agencies and the, the NGOs and the humanitarian organizations that are trying to help the people and making sure that uh, the science of the climate and the science of food production are intimately linked and neither can really succeed. The climate information is not as important as it or not as useful if it's not linked to better decision making. And I don't think we can achieve success on the food security side if we don't really grapple with the questions that the climate information can answer. So I would just take Ruth's first point and take it one step deeper and, and make sure that we have broad equitable access to information and resources, mm. take advantage of what's happening in the rich parts of the world technologically and dispersing it uh, as equitably as possible to the poor parts. Right. So Ruth, um, uh, looking back the last year, um, even in New York, we saw some pretty extremes of climate playing out. And there's a paper just come out from uh, scientists at Lamont, and apart from other, as well as others, um, showing that actually the drought in the Western US is now the worst for over a thousand years. So using tree ring data, they can figure out from the tree rings, how close they are and all the rest of it, they can figure out when it was when it was very dry. And it's pretty clear that we're now in the in the realm of, of being able to see that we're in the midst of a drought that is worse than anything in a thousand years, which is probably when records began. And we're not even through it yet. So um, this is huge in terms of what it will do uh, to agriculture. Um, and at the same time, you've got flooding in parts of Europe going on and 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 amazing heat in the Pacific Northwest. How does, how does the food system get 
I mean, how do these climate shocks really impact the food system and uh, the interconnected nature of food production? Yeah, well, we're certainly seeing the, um, the uh, impacts of, of uh, climate change. That's very much with us. It's not a, not a distant forecast. It's, it's right here. Uh, and these, these climate shocks uh, as, as John has illustrated so well, have such an enormous impact on vulnerable small-scale farmers uh, around the world. Um, that's about 84%, I think the number is, of all farmers are small-scale farmers. So there's a huge impact on the farmers themselves. But then let's think about another uh, level up and the impact on people who are relying on the, the food that is produced by the, uh, the agriculture agriculture, and that's all of us, <laughs> uh, and particularly those who live in um, urban areas. So with climate shocks, and we have such interesting work in the Earth Institute and uh, Climate School on, on, this, uh, on this topic, about how climate shocks in some parts of the world, which produce a lot of the food, which is like our Midwest, uh, Russia, so, you know, some of the wheat baskets of the world, when climate shocks occur in those parts of the world, how the um, impacts cascade and ram of, uh, ricochet to those parts of the world which rely on um, imported food, which is a lot of the developing world. And the people who are very much impacted are the urban poor who are just at the mercy of uh, international prices and spend a very large proportion of their income on, on food. So we saw examples of this in 2008 and 2011 when there were uh, uh, droughts in some part of the world amplified by the government's response that led to these price spikes which just ricocheted around the world and created a lot of hardship. So these climate shocks affect individually uh, uh, farmers but also they affect the whole system and everyone who relies on the, uh, the food that's being produced. John, how does this play into um, IRI's work? Do you actually, these extreme weather events, how do they impact what you're doing? Well, we try to, um, with the seasonal forecast that we produce, we can't say that, uh, you know, in six weeks on a Wednesday, it's gonna rain three inches in such and such yeah. a place. That's not how it works. But we do, we put out the information in, in thirds. So in probabilities, which makes it a little bit complicated. Um, most people don't think in terms of probabilities, but we can say uh, during the next growing season, it's going to be unusually wet or it's going to be unusually dry. Um, some of the work we do, we do work on weather index insurance, which is a different type of crop insurance that's tied to what happens with the weather rather than crop failure. And we work, in order to set those policies up, we'll work with farmers uh, through smartphone apps and enable them to, to rate the, the growing seasons in their memory, is which ones were good and which ones were bad. And then we can correlate them with satellite data and local data. And so we can get a sense of what really constitutes a bad agricultural year. It may seem dry, to a scientist, but it may not be that bad to a farmer, or it may be a whole lot worse than you would think. So we put out these forecasts in terms of probabilities, and this is why, because that's confusing to a lot of people, it's important to work with the support networks that farmers have in agriculture extension or in, in groups like the Gates Foundation that reach out and work directly with farmers. We're also beginning to work on a type of forecast that we call weather within climate, where we can say a little bit more um, about how if the forecast, if the seasonal forecast says the next three months are going to be uh, unusually wet, we can begin to give people an idea with these weather. And the, the goal is to give people an idea of how a higher than normal rainfall average over three months will play out. Will it be a little bit more every single day, or will it be two massive events that just overwhelm the, you know? comprehension or whatever. And you can, think, um, you can predict that, is that what you're saying? What's that? You can predict that. We're working on that. Um, I don't think it's to the point of 
being what we would call an operational forecast. I think it's a rich area for research because if we could get that, it would be a quite a powerful tool yeah. for farmers. Um, but it's still an area of active research. And then the goal longer term is to be able to connect in what we call a, a continuous um, forecast or, or a, um, a seamless forecast is to connect the weather forecast to that 10 day to two month forecast to a three or four month forecast so that a decision maker could look at different periods of time across the next few months and think about all the different decisions that they have to make in the next few hours, the next days, and in the next few months. Okay, so we're running out of time a little bit because I want to get to the audience Q&A pretty soon. <clears throat> so I want sort of short answers to these ones, if that's okay. Ruth, um, tell me about changes in the way people are choosing to eat that, and how this affects food security. Uh, we, we've touched up a lot upon this a little bit already. But, yeah, uh, you... yeah, so we, we, I'll be short, Alex. So we touched on the uh, increase in animal source foods, which is uh, quite a, uh, that's a known trend that when incomes increase, um, uh, people increase their consumption of animal source foods. There's another trend that it's less, people think less about, and that's the increase in uh, the consumption of vegetable oils, which has just gone off the charts, even right. more so than animal source foods. And a lot of those vegetable oils are um, going into processed foods, which are not particularly healthy, and, um, and driving tropical deforestation, which is uh, a big concern for, uh, for CO2 emissions and many other um, reasons. So in addition to the increase in animal source foods, there's also the increase in, uh, in uh, vegetable oils and sugar as well, which yeah, does yeah. the obesity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So maybe I can quickly ask both of you. You were both at COP, as as was I. And uh, uh, to me, it's amazing. I know. I think John, you said you've been fourteen times now. It's like, like you're a veteran. And um, so you both attended. What do you gather from the conference? Did it inform your work? Just very briefly. Do you feel how much do you think the Glasgow COP twenty six made a difference? Ruth, do you want to go first? Okay, well, I'll say I really admire you, John, for going to so many COPs. <laughs> um, um, I thought at this COP in Glasgow, uh, there was a lot of attention on nature-based solutions. There was some attention on food. I, the next COP will, will likely have more attention on food. And there were lots of corporate commitments to net zero, including from the... Uh, um, uh, food industry. So that was all very exciting and very positive. But then you, but at the COP, there's a lot of words spoken, there's a lot of commitments, and the work starts afterwards to, uh, to make those commitments into reality. And that's what I see as a big role for us in, uh, in research and in universities is to try to try to help turn those those good words into uh, real change. Do you want yeah. to say something quickly? Sure, very quickly. Um, I think to, to build off what Ruth just said, a lot of what I heard was talk about the need for capacity building so that um, individuals and, and developing countries can take action for themselves. And that's a, I think that's a positive shift that the sense at the COP is that we're moving out of the time for talking and planning and thinking about what we're going to do and people in, in these partner countries are ready to take action for themselves. And so an institution like the Climate School and the other universities should, you know, I think it's great that we are getting ready to stand up and help these people take, take these steps that they wanna take for themselves. Okay, this is great. And another quick question for you, Ruth. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, do you foresee changes in the way the world is going to change in terms of the menu? And in particular, are there, are there new nutritional products we should be thinking about? Because it would seem crazy not to say something about those. Yeah, I think we are at the very beginning stages of a major food transition. It's not possible to say how that will play out in the future, but there is uh, the alternative proteins, the plant-based and the cell-based, they have a potential to change uh, change diets, uh, 
it's too soon, it's very early days. Uh, but I think with the recognition of the big impact of, on climate and environment from the food system, as well as the need for uh, healthier food, we, we are at the beginning of a, uh, of a major food transition. And just like, I, you know, I can't, my grandparents couldn't possibly have imagined what, what, uh, what their grandchildren would be eating the same way that, uh, you know, I can't even begin to predict what my grandchildren will be eating when they grow up. Yeah, absolutely. Just so very quickly before we go to the q and I asked typically, I always ask for one take home message you'd like to give uh, for the audience. John, what would you, what would your take home message, takeaway message be? John, you're muted. Um, I think, as I said earlier, I think thinking creatively and about ways of getting useful information and the resources for smallholder farmers to act on that information uh, is going to be the key to reaching to to addressing the hunger problems of the poorest and most vulnerable people. And until we do that, uh, I don't think we're going to feel good about fixing the food problems in the wealthy countries if we leave the poor behind. So I think a concerted effort on uh, lifting from the from the bottom is gonna be very important. And I think it's doable, it just is gonna take some effort. Right. Ruth, what's your main takeaway message? Um, I'd say that we are um, in a food transition at the very beginning stages of a food transition, how it plays out, uh, you know, depends on society's will and, um, we try to help that along with the research, but the three pillars of, a, of the kind of food transitions that we would want to see would be um, climate resilient agriculture, uh, food production with reduced environmental and climate impacts, and nutritious food for all. And I would say that this food transition is as important for the future of our planet and the future of our species as is the uh, the energy transition. That's really great. Okay, so we've got about 10, 15 minutes for uh, some questions and uh, from the audience, and there's tons of them coming in. Uh, so I'm going to quickly ask uh, a bit about, first of all, how has climate change affected the frequency of foodborne diseases uh, and contaminated water? It's slightly two different things, really. Um, and it, the relationship between the health of soil and the loss of cropland due to erosion, etc., there are a whole lot of sustainability issues around how we're farming as well. Ruth, do you want to dive in on that? Well, I don't know if John wants to dive in on the contamination, might know more, um, might have something to add about that. But that is um, uh, clearly, clearly a major issue that with increasing uh, temperature and increasing uh, pests that, uh, that we see more damage to uh, damage to crops from pests. So that is certainly an issue as well as um, storage. So a lot of food, particularly in the developing world, um, uh, rots in storage and, uh, and climate weather has an impact on, on that. In terms of the soil erosion, the intensity of rainfall is uh, a, a, a major factor in terms of um, mm -hmm. soil erosion. So the more intense rainfall and um, and the shorter duration for a rainfall event, um, we could expect to see more uh, landslide soil erosion. So, so protecting protecting our soil is uh, uh, that's up there as a as a very important issue because we we all depend on our on the soil. John, do you want to comment on? Yeah, I'll just say very quickly that um, when we think about food security, we think about. Um, not only the ability to get food, to, to find it and to afford it, but also the ability to get the nutrients from it. So if people are ill, they're not going to, they may be eating, but they're not, they're not well nourished. So waterborne disease is incredibly important in, in that aspect of food security. And then, you know, Ruth hit on, uh, on storage and something like about 35 to 40% of food is lost um, in the developed and the developing world. In the developed world, we tend to throw it away. Um, we waste it after it leaves the farm. And in the developing world, it doesn't get off the farm. As Ruth said, it rots in storage or rats and pests get into it. Um, 
So again, uh, figuring out, you know, thinking about this as a systemic issue, it's not just growing the food, but it's, it's hanging on to it so it can get to people and they can eat it and make use of it is really important. So um, uh, let's talk, go back to plant-based diets and actually the increasing um, interest in plant-based diets in developed economies. So of course there are health issues for that as well as I guess um, philosophical motives or uh, as being asked here, um, concern about the environment, et cetera, uh, the ethics of um, um, animal farming. Uh, do you think these are gonna really have much of a real impact, a tangible impact on the environmental effects of agriculture globally? Do you see this as something that's gonna really take over and, and dominate what we're doing in the future? What, what do you think, Ruth? I would, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I th acceptability is a large factor, human behavior and, and what people, um, you know, culturally um, change their diets is a, big, is a big question, but people do change their diets. Uh, so we know that, that, that there is the potential. There's a lot of research to do about looking at these alternative uh, alternatives to animal sourced foods, whether it's plant-based or it's cell cultured, in terms of the environmental impact, the nutritional impact, um, the acceptability, the impact on livelihoods. There's a big open research area on that question. And it's, 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 it's a new question. So I expect that a lot of research will be going into, uh, into that direction. Okay. Um Another question here, I think this is for you, John. Uh, could you speak about the disconnect between food production and food security, especially in developing countries? What is the path to food security in developing countries and how does this differ from optimizing food production while minimizing climate impacts? Sure, I'll try and Ruth, you should certainly feel free to chime in if I leave gaps. Um, you know, Ruth talked about it earlier. Uh, the world produces plenty of food for the six or eight million billion people on earth, um, but it's not in the right places. A lot gets lost in the developing world in storage. Um, and the poor farmers, because they don't have resources like irrigation and, and access to fertilizer and pesticides uh, are more vulnerable to the vagaries of the weather. And so it is not, you know, it's expensive to move food to every corner of the earth. There is plenty of it, but if it's in the wrong place, it's not, it's still not helping the person who doesn't have access to it. So again, the way the food security community thinks about this is that you need access, you need uh, affordability, you need availability, access, and then uptake. So you've got to be healthy, you've got to be able to afford it, and you've got to be able to be near it in the first place. Um, for the second part, on the path to food security in developing countries, we're seeing different approaches. Um, in some countries, there is a movement towards encouraging staple producers, smallholder staple producers, to produce cash crops or non-food crops, such as medicinal plants or plants for other things, so that they have higher incomes and then they can buy staples that are produced uh, more cheaply on bigger farms. Um, as for the, the climate impacts, I think most smallholder farmers have very small impacts. I think a lot of the climate impacts are coming from animal production and large scale uh, plant production. When somebody's, you know, when their food plot is as big as the room I'm sitting in, they just don't have the means to, to cause a lot of climate problems. Ruth, do you wanna add anything? Uh, no, I think you covered it. There's the the definition of food security that has the four elements that that you mentioned: access, ability to absorb the food, um, stability over time, uh, and the production. So the production is just one one aspect of of uh, of food security. 
Okay, we're, we're going to be running out of time soon. I want to, and we've got a ton of very interesting questions here. So I, if you don't know the answer, just say no. But um, if you can answer briefly, that'd be great. So the first one's about AI, artificial intelligence, which I thought was brilliant. So as you know, Columbia University is brilliant at climate modeling. We have a, and we have amazing collaboration with NASA, uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies in this area, as well as a number of other people across our various units. Uh, and now we're doing a lot of work on AI and, and using this to actually inform, uh, to feed into climate models. Do you want to say a little bit about how AI might be able to help with food security and, 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 and modeling uh, the, or coming up with new solutions in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I'll just, I'll just chime in with one thought about that, which is about precision agriculture, which has a lot of potential to efficiently use resources so that, uh, so that farmers know where where and when to apply water or fertilizer. And that has been, you know, that's been expensive, but it's now becoming more and more possible with AI. And um, I think IRI is working in that direction uh, as well to make those uh, precision agriculture technologies uh, widely available. Great. Um, another one here, um, I'm gonna rattle through these quickly. Um, in regards to daily food choices and habits, what are the most significant steps people can take to help decrease climate change? Ruth, I would, uh, my own guess would be, uh, or my own answer would be, you know, eat less meat, um, try to buy locally if you can, and depending on your habits, just eat less in general. That's good. Ruth, what about you? Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, cutting down on red meat, it's very hard to tell people what they should eat. I would never go there, but, uh, but cutting down on, on, uh, on uh, ruminant animals, which produce the methane, uh, yeah. including beef, is uh, certainly the step. And also uh, to have an impact on climate change is to uh, uh, be active politically and, um, and communicate about climate change. So we've also got a question about genetically genetically modified uh, foods. Do you see this as something that is good for the planet or people, or do you think it's harmful, Ruth? What do you think? Ah, uh, the ah, uh, uh, the uh, very loaded question. Um, my take on that question is that GMO is like any technology. It could be used for the good, or it could be used for uh, in detrimental ways. So uh, GMOs are genetically um, modifying. People have been genetically hampering with food crops for a very, very long time. Um, the, in my opinion, the, the issue with GMOs at this point is that who is making the decisions about how this technology is deployed and who, who benefits from, um, from uh, investments in GMOs. Okay, so I think we've got to wrap it up here. Uh, I've, uh, there are plenty more questions. And I'm sorry if you asked questions, we weren't able to get to it. Um, there are, uh, it's, been, it's been great to get such stimulating questions. Um, I'd like to finish up by just thanking Ruth and John for their fascinating discussion. These are tremendous leaders at Columbia University doing uh, brilliant work. And it's great to have them uh, give us their time to share their expertise with us. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us as well, wherever you are. Uh, climate change really does require new forms of scholarship, new ways of thinking, big problems, the future of the planet, what are we going to be looking like in 20 years, 100 years? These are the things we really need to be thinking about. And universities have some of the top scholars in the world, top thinkers in the world, but also they're known for relatively impartial thinking. So uh, if you want to find really creative, important solutions, getting behind universities and connecting with them is massively important. And that's what the climate school, the new Columbia Climate School is all about. And it's building links with businesses, industry and uh, governments and stakeholders and communities globally to help us with that. This is an urgent mission. And tonight's discussion with Ruth and John just demonstrates the important work that's happening right now here to understand, predict and mitigate the impacts of our changing climate. So we ask that you consider supporting our vital work by making a gift. This stuff doesn't just happen. Uh, it requires resources and people need to think about how we can actually uh, do more of this going forward. So your support will make a big difference and help us um, maintain our leadership. But more importantly, it'll really have an impact in the world. 
So uh, when you support the Columbia Climate Score, you're going to be supporting the future of life on Earth. So thank you for joining us. I will uh, hope you will enjoy joining us in the next Earth series, which will be we'll be sending out an invitation. Um, I'm Alex Halliday, uh, wishing you all a safe, healthy few weeks until we see you back here again. And thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs>